A million years have passed since I held you last. I guess a million more will soon go by. This class has already introduced you to a brief history of warnings. And my talk today falls squarely within this scope, but is focused on a specific kind of warning contained in short documentaries targeted primarily at young people. I'm going to tell a different story than Amitav Ghosh does in The Great Derangement, Climate Change and the Unthinkable, in which he argues that most forms of art and literature were drawn into modes of concealment that prevented people from recognizing the realities of their plight. But first, I'm going to take a brief detour to Hollywood and to an odd but remarkable moment in the 1958 Stanley Donen film Indiscreet, starring Cary Grant and Ingrid Bergman. I'm going to show you a short scene in which the film's romantic couple muddles through an awkward conversation about a subject we all turn to when we have nothing else to talk about. The weather. It's unusual for the weather to be so muggy this time of year. Yes, uh, I read an article the other day that claimed the world's weather was changing. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yes, isn't it? This fleeting exchange unintentionally but perfectly distills Ghosh's argument about our collective refusal to acknowledge climate change as the most pressing issue of modern history. Now, I have no idea why Norman Krasna, who wrote the screenplay for Indiscreet, included this moment in his script. But for our purposes, let's say that it summarizes the inaction and indifference that has led us to where we are today. More recently, Nathaniel Rich's 2018 long narrative piece in the New York Times, Losing Earth, reflects on how climate change was almost taken seriously enough in the 1970s and 1980s. And I quote, we understood what failure would mean for global temperatures, coastlines, agricultural yield, immigration patterns, the world economy. But we have not allowed ourselves to comprehend what failure might mean for us. Now I'm gonna run with that idea because documentary films have, in fact, for decades been trying to help us to comprehend what failure to prevent catastrophic climate change might mean for us. To push the discussion beyond small talk or indifference. These films have presented us in classrooms, on televisions, as well as in movie theaters, with the facts, with our failures to be good stewards of the earth, with comprehensible science, and with detailed information about the devastating impacts that will occur if we do not change our behavior in large and small ways. Now I'm gonna sketch out a brief, necessarily incomplete story about how documentary films tried to get young people in particular to both imagine and combat ecological and climatological catastrophe. I'm going to briefly discuss three short documentaries aimed primarily at students that came out in 1940, 1958, and 1972, three very different cultural moments. All of these films urged individual action to save the country, and implicitly, or explicitly, the planet. All of these films promoted ecological stewardship. All of these films urged people to reject selfish behavior and to resist those who dismissed the notion that humankind was actively destroying the planet. And all of these films connected patriotism and environmentalism, which is, I think frighteningly, uh, jarring to think about in the context of our last presidential administration's savaging of our environment and the resistance to climate science that we have experienced in what should be a more enlightened age. Of course, climate change is a necessarily global issue, but documentary filmmakers, climate activists, and even governments often frame it as a national concern in an effort to inspire attention and action. Now, onto those three documentaries we were talking about. I'm going to start with a sponsored film made over 80 years ago at the behest of a Minnesota-based industrial machine producer. In other words, by a corporation who profited from industry made in consultation with the United States Soil Conservation Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, National Park Service, and Forest Service. To conserve our heritage is a celebration of America's natural resources and a critique of the way many of these resources were compromised by negligent human behavior. It is far from a perfect film, as problematic sections on Native Americans and the restorative glories of the miracle plant kudzu readily make apparent. One of the finest of coverings being used more and more for erosion control is porch vine, or kudzu. In the south, this vine, which is good feed for cows, 
grows vigorously and spreads rapidly. But the film's core messages are insightful and seem almost progressive when compared to certain strains of contemporary discourse on the way we treat the environment today. The film condemns wasteful, destructive practices, the decimation of forests, unsustainable farming methods, and the destruction of grasslands by livestock overgrazing, which harm the land and cause erosion, literally moving ecological problems downstream. Add to this overhunting and dam building, as well as pollution by industry, and the film comes out swinging. No one should be allowed to do this to a river, for a river ought to belong to the people and be for their enjoyment. But in many parts of the country, once lovely streams are being turned into stinking open sewers. The blame for every harmful act invoked in the film is laid on the shoulders of greedy and ignorant people, as the film calls them. This film presumes that its audience understands and believes that natural resources must be preserved in order for them to last, in order for us to live in an America worth living in. So many people get pleasure out of our national parks that these areas must always be safeguarded against men who try to cut their timber, dam their rivers, or otherwise despoil them for the benefit of a selfish few. Yes, Bill, this is your country, your American heritage. It belongs to you and to millions like you. We have built a truly great and mighty nation, the greatest on the face of the earth. We have wasted the resources that are the foundation of our greatness. But happily, we are beginning to realize how wasteful we have been. And thanks to the machines that make us a great mechanized nation, we can repair some of the damage we have done to our land. Just think, Bill, we may soon have 200 million persons to feed, clothe, and house. But using the wisdom and knowledge born not only of our successes, but also of our mistakes, we can continue to be the most blessed of all nations. The spirit of conservation now abroad in our land can assure you, my son, and other Americans like you, a life of freedom and prosperity and happiness. Although it contains a healthy dose of American exceptionalism and pro-machine boosterism, To Conserve Our Heritage is primarily the story of people in 1940 stepping up to fix the problems created by earlier generations' misuse of the land, to reforest and regrass, to manage land thoughtfully. In this film, environmental stewardship and patriotism are one and the same. Watching it now, we see how some of the solutions being implemented, like the kudzu, created their own problems. But there is an impressive and important faith that government agencies, corporations, and individuals could work together with the aim of greater good for all. Now when we meet again, we'll look at a partly animated climatological documentary that aired on television in 1958, and a 1972 film that tried to directly inspire protest by and radical change for its viewers. I didn't know before Other two.